Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> quick reminder for you to all be here in this room at 4.30 this afternoon for the grand prize giveaway. There's some really cool stuff there. Raspberry Pis, YubiKeys. Um, and I believe there's a rumor that there might even be a couple of DevConf hoodies um, in the prize pool, um, which seem to be the most popular item. I would like to <laughs> now move on with the next talk and introduce Ralph Bean once again today. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think this talk is going to be more of an odd duck than I'd originally expected when I submitted it to the conference in that it's talking about microservices. And there have been other microservices talks at the conference, but the majority of them have been focused on the aspects of infrastructure that go into supporting uh, that mode of development. Whereas this talk is going to be about the actual process and applications development of building services and the pro microservices and, and some of the problems that, that come with that and why you might, might want to do it. Um, some of that has also been talked about in the JBoss track, but this is not related to JBoss. This is based out of the experience of the Fedora infrastructure team. A and we build the majority of our services in Python. So, so there's some similarities there, but also some, some differences. Oops. So let's talk about technical debt first. Now what, what is technical debt? It's this new uh, financial instrument where you take all kinds of, of, of different technical problems and then you recombine them into like a mortgage-backed derivative. No, that's not technical debt, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> but we're talking instead about uh, uh, bad decisions is really what technical debt comes down to. Bad decisions that end up causing you to pay more down the line than you had to up front, um, which is right the same way that, that financial debt works, is that you pay more over time than you, you, you'd originally gotten out of it. And uh, what that looks like in practice when you're writing code usually comes out in terms of code smells, if people are, are familiar with the term. They're not things that are they're bugs or things that are actually broken about the software, but there's some things about the software that as you're writing it or reading it and working on it, smell bad about the code. Um, so duplicated code, uh, in particular, uh, is something that we see a lot in our, our, our services. I have some examples up here if people are familiar with it, but uh, uh, we have the Fedora account system, and we have all these services across our infrastructure, and all of them need to cache that data, but something just because we've been lazy along the way is we just rewrote the mechanism to cache fast data in every one of these places, and so now whenever that changes, we have problems that we have to go and fix it in all the places and do more work than we did in the beginning when we were just hastily copying code. Um, Long methods and large classes are things that, you know, when you're reading code and you think, oh, this is concise, you know, and readable, and then you get to that one function that goes on for 27 pages, and you think, what is this, you know, what, what does this even do? Um, contrived complexity. Oftentimes you'll have someone who thinks that they're a very, very intelligent programmer, and they want to demonstrate that and immortalize that in their code, and so they take what is, could otherwise be a simple problem and then invent this really convoluted way of solving it to, you know, really maximize their, their use of functional programming or, or something like that. Um, but, so that you know, can be a problem. Uh, places where there are half-implemented features where you, know, you got somewhere but you didn't finish it, that causes so many problems later on because a new reader of the code encounters that and then thinks, you know, what, what did this even do? Am I breaking this? Well, it didn't work when they got there, but they don't know that yet because it's only half-implemented. So it causes lots of confusion and delay. Um, no report documentation, commented out code, uh, you know, having tests that, uh, sorry, having a project that doesn't have any automated test suite, or sometimes even worse, um, uh, having uh, a program that does have tests, but they're constantly in a state of being broken, uh, creates a, a situation of distrust for the tests that developers don't actually use them to improve their, their workflow. Um, and then the, the, kind of, the kind of final code smell is kind of like a social one, where if you look out at your colleagues and, and all of your projects, and if you have a project that no one in your team wants to actually touch, uh, kind of ever, but um, there's no real good way to explain that, that itself is a code smell, even if there's not something specific about it, that people avoid it. Um, uh, the beginning uh, of technical debt, in a lot of ways, is, is, is uh, not knowing how to say no to features, right? When, when you, you receive requests for hundreds and hundreds of features and you want to get them implemented as quickly as possible, you take shortcuts to make that happen. Uh, and sometimes the features don't even make sense to begin with as a part of that, as a part of that project, but you want to make your, your customers, you know, your fellow hackers happy, uh, uh, and so you do it. Uh, you think, I'll take the shortcut and clean up the mess tomorrow. Um, and when the priority becomes pushing code, uh, over having good design and reusability, which is totally understandable, right? Because we all want to be seen as, as good, productive hackers. Uh, we want to push a lot of code, but that, you know, can get, get, we can get in our own way with that. The, so that's the beginning of technical debt. The end, like I was saying, is, you know, it's the end of the dev cycle. We have one more fragile thing in production. Uh, even worse, future dev cycles and deployments take longer and involve more fear and uncertainty about what we're going to do. We find ourselves hesitating from actually deploying what could be a new simple feature. 
when it has all this other cruft around it. Um, and the effect of this on the morale of the dev team is what you really want to avoid, right? Because we want to have happy, healthy dev teams that can actually function and do more work faster. But if you accumulate all this debt over time, you can have a culture of despair, a culture of cynicism on your team, and those are things that you know, ultimately undermine your, your entire project, your entire effort. So <laughs> some numbers on, uh, on, on technical debt in our project, and really just one number uh, is uh, lead time, which in the DevOps world uh, is typically measured as the time between uh, when a commit is committed that fixes a bug or introduces a new, um, a new feature, uh, the time between that and when it is deployed in production. So for our services, we can't actually measure that because we don't have an automated deployment system, so there's no way to map those two together, but we can get close to it by measuring the time in our git commit history between when features are committed and when the release is cut that includes that. So ideally, you want that time to be as small as possible because as soon as you make a change, you want to get it in production to be able to ensure that it works the way that you think it does. If a tremendous amount of time goes by in between those two, uh, those two events, then you wind up in a situation where when you go to deploy, it contains changes that haven't really been tested in the real world, and they were written so long ago that you don't remember anything about them or what they were, any caveats that might be, might be there, and so then you break production and things catch on fire. Uh, so here's just some repositories that were on my, on my machine uh, calculating the, uh, the, the lead time as modified for us uh, with them, and you, so you see like projects at the top that are very popular and being worked on actively, things like Pagger and Moat, uh, have on average a two-day uh, lead time, which means if a feature is committed, two days later it's in production on average, which means that quite often it's actually faster than that. Things are fixed and then they're in production the same day. Uh, and you see a variety of other projects. Um, this is not a, well, I say there's a variety of other projects uh, that are in the, in the good camp on this. And then you get into the bad ones. And they're not the ugly ones, they're just the bad ones in the middle. And you see some of our projects that are larger in scope and have uh, uh, more complexity to them. Uh, things that have less developers focused directly on them. And then the ugly, these are the ones, Check out, take a look at the bottom. Does anyone know Python Kitchen? There's one person. So no, does no, maybe nobody knows any of these services. I, I should maybe explain more. Uh, Kitchen is not actually a service, it's just a Python library that provides uh, a, a, a whole variety of utilities for general purpose programming in Python. Uh, and so it's like everything but the kitchen sink. It's kind of a catch-all bucket. So, I mean, the result of that is that it's this grab bag of you don't even know what's in it, and if you change something in it, what is that going to break? You have no idea, because it's like a totally unstructured mess of, of things. So, on average, it takes 181 days for a commit to make it up in a release in Python Kitchen, which is a really long time. So, uh, I have highlighted in bold up there things like uh, Nuancia. That is our uh, web application for voting, uh, collecting votes from the community on supplemental wallpapers for Fedora. Uh, and so, the the lead time there of 52, day, 52 days actually makes a lot of sense because we only hold elections uh, uh, every so often on, on, on intervals. So typically we'll have an election, find some bugs, fix the changes then, but then we'll forget to deploy them until the next election comes along. So it has a pretty regular, even lead time there. So what do we do uh, about this? There are, there are cultural practices for dealing with, with technical debt, uh, and we all kind of know them. They're just good dev practices, right? So, so um, don't, don't let these things happen. Just be a good coder all the time. Um, there's the Boy Scout rule. The, the Boy Scouts of America have this, this rule that if you go to a campsite, you need to leave it cleaner than it was when you, you got there. Do the same thing with code. When you check in a patch, you should also fix any kind of cruft around at the same time. Um, but this only goes so far because we're under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure to produce code uh, uh, faster. Um, you can have institutions like code review. I mean, everybody should be doing code review these days. Uh, no features without a test. That's kind of a given. It's elementary in, in software development these days. Um, and we've recently started experimenting on, on my team with instituting um, week-long or multi-day-long periods where we all take a break from working on other, other aspects of our projects and then instead just focus on dealing directly with technical debt. And we'll, we'll see how that plays out um, in time as we do it again and again. So those are cultural practices, and this kind of gets to the, the core of what I want to talk about is architectural practices and how can we design our systems in a bigger way to help reduce, uh, hopefully, the tendency to, to introduce technical debt into our projects in the first place. Uh, so microservices is, is the very, very popular talk, topic these days. Uh, something to, to think about. If you look at the, I don't have a graph of it, but the Google search history results for it just begin to go up really fast in 2014. In 2015, it's through the roof. I mean, it's just astronomical. Um, it is sometimes up for debate, or it's confusing. What is the difference between uh, service-oriented architecture, which is an old term, you know, over a decade old now, and microservices? Uh, and it's not clear that there really is any fundamental difference between the two. It's really just kind of a restatement and refocusing of the service-oriented architecture literature 
into this microservices thing. And it sounds, it sounds good, right? Micro, very good. Uh, so some characteris characteristics of microservices. Uh, it's, it's, uh, what it boils down to is just component, componentization of your software into services. Componentization is the name of the game in software generally, right? When you write your first program when you're uh, you know, in the sixth grade, uh, it's this really, really big, long script that just goes through and does one thing after another. And eventually it gets so long that you realize you need to organize it into functions. And then as you write more complex software, you have to organize those functions into classes, and then those into modules, and so on. So this is just yet another degree or layer of componentization, uh, but uh, typically along the line of a network service or a network boundary. Um, uh, the, the literature talks about organizing microservices specifically around business capabilities. So that's how you try and figure out what should be a microservice and what shouldn't be. Uh, a case for like an, uh, like an enterprise example would be payroll, right? Like payroll serves a, a specific business capability in your organization, and so building a, a service to you know, represent payroll would be uh, uh, one way to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, another aspect is smart endpoints uh, and dumb pipes, uh, which is something that I, I hadn't really encountered until I started doing research for this talk. But the, the idea here is that you have really, really intelligent services and clients, but the, the mesh that connects them, uh, whether that's HTTP and REST or uh, a message bus or something like that, should be really, really dumb. Um, so the, the counter example to this is the ESB, the enterprise service bus, or the egregious spaghetti box, right? Which you have all these, all these services, and they get connected to one another, but none of the services are in control with who they can talk to and what kind of data they, they consume. Instead, there's this box in the middle, the ESB, which has to be administered and defines all the routing and mapping and the queues between all these different aspects. So uh, that tends to be a single point of, point of failure technically, in that if it goes down, everything else is down. But it's also a single point of fail failure socially, um, because in order to get any sort of change done, you have to go to committee and get people to agree to add certain rules to your, uh, to your, to your ESB box uh, to do what it needs to do. In contrast, think of the internet, um, where you have smart servers, HTTP servers, sorry, sorry the web, more web web. You have smart HTTP servers and smart browsers, but the connection between them is a really, really dumb thing. You can go and request any website that you want. I mean, it's like absurd to think of any other way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, other ideas like decentralized government, uh, which right, has like this political twist, but it's more about how you organize your, your, your projects. Um, decentralized data management. Um, uh, in this case, uh, Amazon uh, had this famous rule, right, that no two services should share access to the same database directly, that every database needs to have a service in front of it with an HTTP interface that you then uh, interact through. And if you've ever worked on a project where there were, or a couple projects where things shared read and write access to the same database, you know that it's a, it turns into a horrible, horrible mess down the road where, again, you change one, you have no idea if it's going to break the others, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, a requirement if you begin getting into microservices is uh, uh, application, excuse me, uh, infrastructure automation. And this just means if you're deploying, gonna be deploying, excuse me, going to be deploying more services, uh, then you need to have some sort of way to automate the, the deployment of them. Otherwise, you, you burn way more time doing that. Uh, and then designing for failure, right? If all of your, your services are now uh, distributed in that they rely on a, like a network boundary to communicate with one another, that can fail and it will fail. So your services can no longer you know, expect that the, the function that they used to call will return with no problem, but instead they have to expect that you know, it may not return at all, or it may time out, uh, it may, may fail in ways that weren't expected. So graceful degradation is the name of the game there. Um, and evolutionary design, right? I mean, designing like a, an entire suite of microservices up front is one thing, but if you have them already split in the first place, then you can add them incrementally and change your, your, your entire architecture uh, that way. Uh, so so how, how big is a microservice? It's not. Um, you know, it's not clear. There's a lot, a lot of, lot of uh, disagreement about it. So, so one, and this is the one that I like the most, is that if, if you can describe the service with one responsibility, that it's responsible for one data asset or one type of data asset, that that's a good uh, limitation to put on it. Uh, other people argue that it's primarily about um, like developer cognitive resources. So if the developer can't rewrite it from scratch in two weeks, then it's too big. Or if the developer can't hold it in their head all at one time while thinking on it, then it's too big. But those are you know, maybe flaky or fluffy definitions. Um, with, uh, I mean, in contrast to monolithic architectures, right, where you have a handful of very, very large apps that do a lot of things, excuse me, that do a lot of things themselves, when you scale out to having lots of, of microservices, you put this, this new kind of load on your operations team and the amount of deployment work that they have to do. Um, so in order to, to, to deal with that and making sure that we don't have, you know, that pendulum that swings back and forth between dev and ops and 
each one of them pissing the other one off uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, there are, are different patterns and suggestions for how to deal with that within your organization. One is the you built it, you run it rule, uh, which is that you, when you deploy, excuse me, when you write a new service and you deploy it, you need to be responsible for uh, the, the operations of that service, at least for a certain amount of time. Um, and so Google does that, for instance, where the, the dev team has to operate the service for the first couple months of its existence, and then it goes over to an operations team that then works on it. But if the Nagios alerts go through such a threshold that the dev that it's like a predefined threshold for, for when that happens, then the operations will hand it back to dev, and they then have to answer their Nagios calls in the, in the middle of the night again for that. So ensures a certain degree of, of accountability. Um, and uh, another aspect, too, is that when you have all these variety of services, how do you make sure they're all actually working? So, so application telemetry and doing monitoring of the actual features in the application is really important uh, as well. So Etsy does this, right, in that they have uh, 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 instrumentation on every single feature on every single app, not just at the infrastructure, but in the application itself. So every time someone clicks on, uh, on the login page on Etsy, there's like, they have a graph in Collect D for views of the login page and then a separate graph for actual logins. So you can get the difference and see how many people see the login page and get confused, right? And, and walk away. Uh, LinkedIn does this to the max in that they actually log all of your keystrokes and mouse movements and how much time you spend on different sections of the page. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, but that gives them crucial feedback that they can use to feed back into the development process. Um, in terms of thinking of our applications and Fedora infrastructure, uh, if people know old PackageDB, it was a classic example of a monolith for us that we then split into a variety of services. Uh, it had it's package DB, and package is a really loose thing, so it has everything to do with all packages. Well, that's too big. Um, what we've narrowed it down to now is that the package DB should, should be responsible only for ACLs, for who has access to packages and who does not. Um, but it used to have this application data in there, which has since been split out into things like AppStream, and it used to have this mechanism to vote on packages and rate them and tag them and stuff, and we split that out into another service called Fedora Tagger. And as a result, we're able to iterate on package DB, which is a, a really critical system, but much more uh, uh, quickly than we could otherwise. Um, we have FAST. FAST similarly has a whole bunch of responsibilities for granting Koji certs and um, managing people's individual accounts. It used to also be the login mechanism for all of our other web applications. Uh, so we split that onto Ypsilon and are using OpenID uh, now, which decoupled those two. Uh, and Bodhi. Um, how many people in the room know Bodhi? Have you used Bodhi? Cool, great. So, so Bodhi is this, this really uh, another really important piece of our infrastructure, but think about the things that it's responsible for. It's the place that packagers go to submit uh, a, a new update. It's the place that QA people come to you know, give feedback on, on updates. It's the place that you go to manage build root overrides, which it's not clear that really has anything to do with updates at all. And then it's also baked in, especially in the old Bodhi one, baked into the same application is the release engineering process that actually produces the repos. So there's so many things going on there that iterating on Bodhi, especially Bodhi 1, was really difficult. And Bodhi 2 is... is is a lot more separated out and, 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 and easier to hack on now. Uh, let's say Koshi and, and uh, the new package DB arrangement and FMN, all three of them I think are really good examples of, of peeling off the different responsibilities of services, of uh, peeling off the different responsibilities of a monolith into different uh, uh, services. Uh, and we're really happy with the way those are working. Like Koshi is composed of, of four different services that all have different things that they're responsible for in the process of doing that continuous integration. So if we want, so we're, we're headed down this path already of, of doing a microservices split up in Fedora infrastructure, and we're like well on our way through it. Um, but if we want to take it further, I think um, there's some prerequisites that we would need to meet. Uh, we're well on our way on some of them and not very well on our way on some others. Uh, the first being automated tests. We have them. Almost all of our applications have them. Some of the older ones don't. Um, uh, but there is a limitation. There are limits to what we're doing now, and we can maybe think outside the box and go to some, some bigger scale uh, uh, testing ideas for our, our apps. Uh, without automated tests, you have no idea you know, if you're going to break production when you push these things as, as fast as you want to be pushing them. Um, rapid provisioning of, of new hosts for new services uh, is something that we actually don't have at all. It's really difficult right now to provision a new service in Fedora infrastructure, and it's probably our biggest pain point. And I mentioned in a talk earlier, earlier today that um, a, a side effect of that is that it encourages our developers to bolt on functionality to existing apps instead of saying, oh, this clearly needs to be its own thing. Except once they write the app, there's then like a, a week to two week wait period while we actually just set up hosts and basic infrastructure for it. So that's uh, something we can get a lot better at, I think. Um, against provisioning, rapid application deployment, we're actually pretty good at that right now. We have uh, fully automated playbooks for maybe half of our applications that with one run of a playbook, it does all the things that need to happen to upgrade the service from an old version to a new version, which includes like taking it out of the proxies, taking it out of Nagios, 
um, updating a front end and a back end, shutting them both down, doing a, a database upgrade, starting everything up in the, in the opposite order. So that is now like a flick of the wrist, and it's really nice to have, and it's facilitated uh, uh, more development. So. Uh, monitoring, uh, again, we have that, but it's not automatic yet, so we have to remember to add things to Nagios when we deploy new services, and that has, we've forgotten to do that, I mean, more than once, so that's one of the things you just need to be automatic so you can move without, without fear. Uh, and a DevOps culture is something that I think our team has had from the beginning, uh, just in that we have a really organic relationship between our dev team and our ops team, where we hang out in the same places in IRC, we're basically the same people, we hand information back and forth, and we're, we also have an organic relationship with our customer, right? If we have a customer, the customer is the Fedora community, right? So we are packagers ourselves, so we get to feel the pain point and have really, really, feel the pain points of our own apps and then know what bugs we need to fix to be able to move forward, so without that, you can get into a lot of, a lot of trouble and mess with miscommunication. Um, so, uh, of all those things we can talk more about and, and dive more into, I want to focus just on testing, kind of for the rest of the talk. Um, so, that, I mean, there's, there's different strategies for testing, right? And uh, so here are four, there are more. Um, but we do really well component testing, the first, and end-to-end -end testing, the last. Um, for end-to-end -end testing, we have a tool called Rube, which is really just a, a thin wrapper over Selenium that steps through our entire staging infrastructure and logs into services and tries to post a Bodhi comment and does all kinds of things, but it takes a really long time to run, uh, just because it takes a long time to run, run through all that. So it is cool in that we are sure that all of staging is working, but it's, it's a huge limitation because as you're making changes, you can't just run Rube and then know right away what's wrong and fix it. You're waiting for you know, a half an hour for the thing to complete. On component testing, I mean, that's like what people call unit testing. We, we actually don't do any unit unit testing of, of specific functions, but we do tests of our, our whole components, like what you might call a functional test, that you know, an HTTP call will return this kind of data and, and things like that. Um, in the middle, integration testing and contract testing, we actually don't do any of that right now, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk some about possibilities for that. So contract-based testing, has anybody heard of contract-based testing? The one name we talked about it earlier. Great, great, so some people know, th this just blew my mind, I think it's the coolest idea. Um, the idea is, well, so start off, we have services, right? Um, service A, uh, under the hood, talks to service B when a request comes into it and returns data, which, which then comes back to the client. Um, that happens. So when we're running a test on our system, we don't want to actually have to make a call out to service B, either because we're in a test environment and it doesn't exist, or if we could stand it up, it's gonna take a long time to do that interaction and we want our tests to run fast. So what we do, the standard practice is to mock uh, that request, and that involves building a kind of fake uh, code object that returns fake data, uh, but then you can test the path in your own, your own, compo your own service uh, and move along. But it generates, oh, excuse me, just go back. This just generates new problems, right? Because over time, service B's own API changes, right? It's being actively developed, and if its API changes, that um, thing that you mocked out, um, you said it was going to return this data, but the service really doesn't return that data anymore. So your tests are still passing, even though when you push to production, you're going to break and, and you don't know. This is called uh, fragile mocks or brittle mocks, uh, and it is totally our problem. I mean, we have it in every one of our applications. We have to, there, it's not that the tests are worthless, but we just have to be hyper aware of what mocks we need to change when we change another service. So that introduces a lot of lag and, and pain for us. So the gist with contract-based testing is to just take a step back and realize that service B, the thing that you're depending on, it also has its own test suite. Uh, and you have put a lot of work into that test suite to make sure that it tests all the interfaces and does what you think it should do. Um, those tests you know, are, are written in some code and they can't be automatically pulled out this way, but they boil down to saying, service B saying, when I am called this way, you know, I'm gonna return this kind of data. And when I'm called this way, I'm gonna return this kind of data. Assert that to make sure that's true. If you could take that data in that test and extract it out, you can actually do some really useful things with that. So that's the idea with contract-based testing. You take what was the test of service B and ship it as a library that is then used as a mock for service A and everything else that depends on service B too. So that when you change service B, um, you presumably change the tests, right, to make sure that the, the new functionality is working how you want. You then distribute that library and notice that, oh, all your tests failed in service A and you can you know, fix that before it even gets to, to any further environment. Uh, and this extends beyond just, you know, two services in, in, in isolation, right? Like a whole chain of things, you can figure out all sorts of problems about them uh, with this strategy. Um, for the other testing strategies, so that was contract-based testing. Uh, for integration testing, um, I saw a talk the other day by um, the JBoss developers talking about Archelian Cube. Um, anybody know Archelian? 
Do one, one hand. It was really cool, right? So it's in the Java world, so we typically you know, don't, don't trade technologies back and forth unless we go researching, the, uh, researching for them and looking for them. But I was kind of blown away. It's, so it's um, uh, a platform and a framework to use in, in your tests to start up the services that are under test and their dependencies inside containers, um, which is cool on its own. So you can actually do a full integration test on your own box of service A and service B. You have a kind of YAML definition that describes here are the other service relationships, so start up these other containers, uh, and you can test them kind of end to end uh, on your own box relatively quickly, right? It's slower than, than contract-based testing or component testing because you have to actually make the database call to, data, to the database and actually have to return it, but it, uh, uh, it's faster than end-to-end -end testing for sure. The really, the really cool thing that they, they did, they had this Archelian cube, uh, cube.q, the letter Q, um, and what it does is it then introspects all of your containers to find all of the ports that they've exposed to one another, and it inserts TCP proxies between all of them. So then in your test, you can write like with a, with a, context, decor, uh, a context manager uh, decorator, uh, say in this test, you know, do the interaction that you did before, but make the TCP connection close prematurely, or slow it down to the rate of like a, a dial-up modem, or make it do a slow close, or things like that, so you can simulate all kinds of network failures and test things that you could never test before. We can't even test that in our staging infrastructure. No, you know, it's a whole new, whole new ballgame. So. Uh, so from testing, the, the, the kind of last thing I'll just I'll touch on is like for, for Fedora, what would uh, a continuous deployment tool chain look like for us? Uh, and this is just a proposal, right? It's not something that we'll necessarily actually do, but it's kind of cobbling together the pieces that we do have that are already relatively mature, and just with a little bit of glue, we can get very close. So um, we you know, have Git repos both on GitHub and on Pagger. We have a Jenkins instance, but we would have to really beef it up, I think, to do this, because we would need to make sure that all those tests run in a trusted environment and make sure they pass before we move forward. Um, we would need, uh, 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 in this instance at least, is thinking about using copper uh, as the place where we would actually build the RPMs to deploy to our systems, which is, which is what we do. Uh, but we would need a policy change. Right? Currently, we have to have everything that we deploy is in Fedora or Apple, uh, but copper is not in that, in that subset, right? so we would need to revise our rules uh, to do that. We would then need some sort of system that would just map our Git repositories to the playbooks that do the updates, which would be a very, very small piece of Python code, uh, I think, to write. Uh, and then we would just have to make sure that all those upgraded playbooks I was talking about, we actually have a full suite of them, because uh, right now we only have half our services are automatically upgradable. Uh, and then very, very last, we would have you know, an arithmetic amount of work to get all of our services ready to do this in Git and in Jenkins and in Ansible. And that is not you know, uh, an exponential amount of work. It's, it's accomplishable, you know, something we could do in a, in, in a year. Um, but yeah, so that we, we could do that. Um, so. The question is maybe why bother, right? So like there's, there's all this hype about microservices. We have this huge you know, astronomical graph of, of searches uh, on Google. Uh, but we have to do a lot of stuff to be able to get there. We have to have new test frameworks and this contract-based thing and the container thing. And then we have to have new playbooks. And we've got to set up Jenkins. And you know, it's like not you know, just do it on a whim. Um, so I mean, what problems do microservices actually solve for us? Uh, one of the big answers is that they are web scale. right? You know, uh, but that's not necessarily a problem for us, right? We don't have any kind of traffic that's coming at us like one of the, 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 the major infrastructure sites on the, on the web. Um, you know, if you have a monolith and you need to add more capacity, you have to duplicate the whole monolith along extra app nodes. But if you have microservices, you can just scale the ones that you know are under, under heavy load. But again, that's not, you know, that's not really our, 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 our problem. Um, a problem that it, it may help solve for us if we carry it out to its full, full conclusion uh, is just scaling the ability of our, our developers to reason about the code that they're changing and move faster in that direction. And that's the thing that I think we really want to uh, uh, focus on. Bodhi being right, like the big counter example of it taking so long to get to a version two rewrite because it involves so many things to, to think about. Uh, a last word, a last slide on complexity. Um, so uh, by doing microservices, we're going we're to get stronger boundaries between our systems and less kind of bleeding of, of, of functionality and implementation between them. Uh, simpler subsystems, they'll be independent of one another, so we can change them and take them down uh, uh, without that much coordination or worry. Uh, and an op we have an opportunity here to get into some technological diversity that we've never been able to do before. We have a rule of only Python in our infrastructure, which is not because we're like Python chauvinists, uh, but is just because you know, we only have a few developers, right? And if we start introducing Erlang and Scala and Go and all these other things, not all of us are you know, necessarily proficient in those languages to be able to fix any problems. So. Um, but with microservices, we have an opportunity to do that where we didn't before where thing, when things were more tightly coupled. Um, and uh, let's say lastly, there's this initial investment right, in, in code complexity. Right? When you are writing a monolith from the get-go, you can write the whole thing 
and, and, and put it together. But with microservices, you now have to start with these test frameworks that mock out other subsystems that maybe don't even exist yet. Uh, and so that's a cost you have to pay. But the idea is that over time, the amount of maintenance work that you have to perform to put into these systems goes, it doesn't, I'm trying to say, the amount of maintenance work uh, doesn't necessarily go down, but it doesn't escalate in the way that it does with giant monolith systems. Um, so yeah, that is, is all I have. If people have questions, I, I'd love to answer them. Oh, wow, I'll talk a couple. I'll start with you. Uh, you mean like desktop? Yes. And uh, we have a lot of technical devs that are uh, up to speed. And I'd like to think that if something isn't, it is suitable for us and it is manageable in a small uh, amount of people. Yes, because we have a small amount of people. But that's the risk that you get to. I mean, we, we have maybe four full time developers and three full time sysadmins, but their responsibility is spread across maybe 40 or more services. Um, and it's at the point for us where I think it would be, it, it is definitely risky to proceed much further down this road for us. Um, but it's not clear yet whether it'll be a good win or not. So to repeat the question, the question was, is this a suitable, um, uh, is this architecture uh, suitable for application to small teams? Correct. Uh, other questions, Dennis? Right, right. So in, the, in that situation, we just uh, don't allow changing of things that you might refer to as a primary key. So we just, we're not allowed to rename so things in package you kind of move up front when you're designing your microservices. Yeah, and it's tough to know what you'll need you know, at that point. We definitely didn't think that through that explicitly. I think there was just an assumption that the package name is the package name. And if you, if you were to rename it, you would instead be deleting one and creating a new one. And if you really cared about the data, then you would have to manually script you know, a migration in the dependent services. So. Yes, Mike? I was wondering how the, this idea of microservices meshes with um, the rapid application deployment. Because every time you create a service or break out something from another service, you're creating more integration. And um, so every time you release, you potentially break dependencies of that service. And <clears throat> I know the answer is generally <coughs> integration testing, automated integration. Yeah. But as you get more and more services, is that really realistic to expect that combinatorial testing problem to be manageable? So that also has been the pain point that we're hitting right now, where the number of interactions is, while not exponential, it's, it's very large. Um, and I, we haven't embarked down the road to yet to figure out if it will work in practice, but I think contract-based testing is really going to be the savior there. If I could jump back to the slide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, where did it go? There it is. Um, th there's, there's two models for how to carry this out, too. There's consumer-driven contract tests and producer-driven contract tests. And what I described was a producer-driven contract test, where service B is the thing providing the service kind of at the end of the day. Uh, and so we use its tests as the mock and push things kind of socially in that direction. But the one that actually looks to be most prominent in the literature is consumer-driven contract testing, where you, you make service A write its expectations in some format. And then you submit those to service B, and service B is expected to include all of its many consumers' contract expectations in its test suite. So then you know in service B that if you ever make a change, you, you know which service it's going to break because you're running their tests. You're, you're running yourself against their expectations. Does that make sense? Right, but that, I think that exacerbates the combinatorial problem, right, where now you have, you have to push the expectations of a single new service into every other service that it interacts with. I agree. It seems like a really crazy like, management problem. Is it even going to social aspects of like, communicating with how to run your team? Yeah, I, you know, I agree. And that's why I'm leaning towards the, the, the producer-driven one, where um, we take our most dependent on service and begin working on it. And then we can later then enable its dependent services to pull in its, its contract. So does that become a problem if your services are not using the same either frameworks and or languages? Uh, 
it, it could, so you would have to write the framework that performs this in some sort of language agnostic way. Um, for instance, there's, uh, I know, three implementations that, that do this. Um, there's one in Java, and I think there's two different ones in Ruby. I haven't found a Python one yet, but they, they all of them share the, the capacity that they can work by integrating directly with the process that's being tested, right? If it's in Ruby, it can attach to the Ruby test suite and just do it right there. But for everything else, it has a standalone server mode. Um, where it, you'd stand it up just as a separate process on the box, and then you actually make HTTP requests to it, and all it does is read a YAML file and return the expected response, or a 404, or a... Or a so, so the test, the contract would necessarily agree to be libraryized, or would be in some... I use the word library, um, but yeah. Yeah, it could be in some, some independent format, and probably should be. Um, for us, we could get away with doing it as a library simply because we're already a mono language in Python, but that was perhaps unwise to, to start there. Cool, no problem. Uh, yes? Yeah, I'd be curious to look at it and analyze it, but uh, we don't have any Java or Maven or Gradle anywhere in our pipeline right now, so it would be a, a big hurdle for us to form it, but I'd, I'd love to look at it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, Lubos? Yes. Yes, and we take that on on a case by case basis. We don't have a general solution. Um, Bodhi is a good example. How do you refer to an update? Um, you can refer to it as the comma delimited set of all the builds that are in it, but that can change. And then there's the Fedora update ID, but you know there's this this big kind of cryptic string that is the update ID. But that it used to be that that was not set initially at update creation. Only later, once it made it into a push, so there was this period of time where there was no key there, um, and we resolved that by assigning that alias, the cryptic string, uh, at the very beginning of creation, and then ensuring that that never changed. So, but that's a case-by-case -case basis, I think. Yeah. Steno? I wonder if, um, because as you mentioned, right, uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in different parts of the open source ecosystem, uh, so, and big chunks of it are not Python. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I tried this weekend. <laughs> so yes, that's good. We should do more of that. And there's not enough of that for sure. So. Other questions okay, so in the back? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We're out of time. If you want to ask a question, we can talk up front. So sure. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Those, those who ask questions, please go and grab your scarves. You deserved it. Oh, yes, right. I didn't do my job. I said I would do it. I have a card. Uh, you can have two. Price of one. <laughs> Not that close. Uh, 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 yeah. I had a question about 
Oh, so you said the coaching is actually the core for Yeah. Ability. Yeah. So um, like in practice, are villains like developed together or they're just kind of very independent? Like I wonder how independent are microservices when it comes to like development perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, so it, again, it's case by case basis, right? But like, Koshi was developed with all four from the outset. They like first saw it and just designed it, and that is rare, I, I think. Typically, you start with things uh, as one service. Uh, they, they recommend that you build a monolith first, so you understand what your your problems will be, and that's after that is when you start scaling it. But you try and go into it with an expectation of trying to keep things uh, clean. Certainly, in Fedora, we we didn't have that in the beginning. We had a lot of monoliths uh, staggering around. So. Yeah. Yeah. They're all in the same Git repo, you know, so they all have the same README, but they're like all kind of part of the same thing. And the thing about it, I mean, they, they work with Koji as if Koji is just yet another microservice. And Koji too is composed of Koji D, the Koji Hub, Kojira. I mean, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> Everything else in it. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Hey. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Talking about not, not some combinatorial kind of like products, but from a developer perspective, I'm, I'm a TDD guy, but still I'm kind of missing like the monolith perspective, kind of like the stack style, just like organic testing, as you said, like integration wise, right? Uh -huh. Should I just like forget about it? It's like, it seems kind of related to how I felt about just like getting rid of my object oriented programming mindset now. More the functional side. Yeah, me too. Maybe, maybe, so, like yeah, we have a handheld. Completely on the wrong track still. Yeah. Just like, should, should I just embrace it? Like, okay, breathe and let it go and just like go for the, uh, uh, as you said, like contract based testing stuff? Uh -huh. Or would you think like it just has shifted to, for example, a staging environment where in the end you just still log on there and, and do the end to end test? Look through, uh, click through and test everything? Would that be. Yeah. Well, so I mean, we 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 had done that for a long time, and we're reaching the limits of it now. Where I mean, perhaps it's it's a, a oh, that's a move. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, it depends on the complexity, right? Uh, uh, 